محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجعلناهم أئمة يهدون بأمرنا وأوحينا إليهم فعل الخيرات وإيقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وكانوا لنا عابدين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I begin by congratulating all of you on this auspicious occasion, the birth of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. And second, I would also like to thank you all for listening to me and thank you for inviting me as well. As we gather to celebrate the birth of Imam Zain al Abidin, the fourth Imam, who was born on the 5th of Sha'ban in the year 38 after Hijrah, 38 years after the migration of Rasulullah from Mecca to Medina, this great Imam, his father, was Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And his mother, she was the Persian princess. She was the Persian princess that came from after the Muslims expanded during the time of the second Khalifa. They brought prisoners and they brought the, the daughters of the king, the Persian king, they brought them. As they brought them, some of the, what, the Khalifa and some of the individuals, they said, let's make them slaves. Amir al-Mu'mineen said, no, we're not going to make them slaves because if someone is Aziz in his own nation, don't let him go, don't let that person be disgraced. If someone is respected in, amongst his own people, let us also respect him. This is the akhlaq of Islam. So Amir al muminin they told him, but they're captured, they're prisoners of war, and they're slaves. If someone is a prisoner of war, they become slaves, or they have to buy, the, they have to either teach, or they have to do something to get rid of that slavery, because they were fighting the Muslims. So Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib said, this is a slave that is owned by all of the Muslims. So I let go of that part. I let go of my ownership. As soon as one person, this is one of the ahkam of the slaves, at that time there used to be slaves, and I will mention it later on as we talk about Imam Zain al Abidin. If a slave is owned by more than one person, if one person freed that slave, they cannot sell that person anymore. They cannot do anything. So Amir al Mu'minin, he said, I, my share, I free, this per I free them. There were, there were more than one, there were a few women. He said, I free them. So once they freed them, all of the Muslims, they can't do anything. They cannot own them anymore because he freed his part. Now they cannot own them. So they became free women. Then they asked, they asked them, what do you want to do? One of them married Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and she became the mother of, and she became a Muslim and a good Muslim and she became the mother of Imam Zain al-Abidin 
Imam Zain al-Abideen, he lived two years of his life during the Imama of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And ten years during the Imama of Imam al-Hasan. And eleven years during the Imama of his father. Of his father, Amir, of his father Imam al-Hussein. And after the day of Ashura, his Imama lasted for 34 years. And there are many lessons that we can learn from the life of this great Imam. The fourth Imam, Imam Zain al-Abideen, who took on the difficult task of guiding the Ummah and restoring the faith in Islam after a leader like Yazid came into power. After someone like Yazid who caused so much damage to the religion of Islam. Someone like Yazid who didn't allow the Imams to speak. You know, the worst thing that anyone can think of happened to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So imagine what they would have done to Imam Zain al Abidin. Imagine the circumstances and the situation that the Imam lived in, in that very difficult atmosphere. An atmosphere that was fueled with the hatred against the Ahlul Bayt. Imagine you're living, you're a follower. You're a person, you're a mu'min, you're a believer, you're living amongst the Daesh people. This is, this is the type of person Yazid was and his people. They behead, they stomp on the chest of Imam Hussein, they kill anyone that comes in front of them. This is the type of environment that Imam Zayn al-Abdin was living in. What is he supposed to do? How is he supposed to teach? He's an Imam. He has to guide. He has to do Amr bin Ma'roof. Therefore, we see that Imam Zayn al-Abideen, his role was different from the role of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein's role was different from the role of Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan's role was different from the role of Imam Sadiq and Imam al-Baqi. Each Imam, they made, they fulfilled their responsibilities according to their own circumstances and according to the time that they lived in. The Imams didn't have, they weren't living in total freedom like today we are living in. Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam spent many years in jail, in prison. Imam Sadiq, he was under house arrest. The Imams, they were all imprisoned and they all had to practice forms of taqiyya. So Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, he managed to fulfill his role as an Imam through his own way. And we will cover what he did. A few, a few very important points in the life of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. One is that Imam Zain al-Abideen managed to guide people and manage to teach people in his own way. In a society where ver people were very far away from the teachings of Islam. Now, the time that Imam Zayn al-Abdin was living in after the day, of, the day of Ashura, people, most of the people had not seen Rasulullah anymore. They, were, they came after the life of Rasulullah. So the Islam that they opened their eyes to was the Islam of Muawiyah and the Islam of Yazid. So many people were misled. Many people didn't know what was the real Islam. Just like today. Just like today. Why do many people have the wrong impression of the religion of Islam? Because their Islam, the Islam that they know, is the Islam that Fox News tells them. The Islam that they know is the Islam of Osama bin Laden and the Islam of these criminals. They don't know the real Islam. This is why many people have hatred and grudges towards the religion of Islam. This is why we have a job, we have a duty to, to show the world what the true religion of Islam is. We have, a, we have an obligation, especially here living in this society where many people don't know about Islam. Many people have the wrong impression of the religion of Islam. Our job is to teach people. Sometimes you teach through going out and talking. Other times you teach through your actions. You can teach in many different ways, but we have a duty. Don't say, don't think that you don't have a duty to deliver the religion of Islam. Every single one of us on the day of judgment, we will be held accountable. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is going to tell me, what did you do? Rasulullah is going to ask me, what did you do for the religion of Islam? When I was being attacked, when the Quran was being attacked, when the religion of Islam was being attacked, what did you do? What am I going to say? What am I going to answer Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Every single one of us must have an answer. I cannot say, let the ulama speak. 
every one of us, we can do something in our own way. And we must do something in our own way. So Imam Zayn al-Abideen, in that difficult circumstances that he was living in, he fulfilled his role. He fulfilled his role as an Imam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the role of the Imam as an Imam that guides by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا The hidayah from the Imam comes by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ We taught them, we inspired in them to do the khayr, fi'la al-khayrat, وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ And to stand for salah. Not only stand and pray, but to teach people how to pray. أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ قَدْ أَقَمْتَ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ And given zakat, وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ And they were worshippers, they were عَابِدِينَ These are the qualities of the Imam. Whenever you see anyone coming and saying, I'm the Imam of the Muslimin, I'm the Imam of the Muslims, you come and you see, does this person follow this, this verse? وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا If someone like Yazid says, I'm an Imam, but this person does not guide, this person does not even pray, this person drinks, immediately you know that this is not an Imam. We have to use our mind, we have to use our intellect. Today, many Muslims, anyone that comes and sits on the mambar, right away they believe him. Anyone that comes and says, I'm Amir al-Mu'mineen, they believe him. Whoever comes and says, I'm, say, says something, right away they believe him. This is wrong. We have to use our intellect. We have to use our aql. And the Imam alayhi salam, this is what he taught the people. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he started the bedrock, the first foundation of the school of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. It was started by Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In Medina, he, was, he would teach people. Of course, the Imam didn't have the freedom that Imam al-Sadiq had. He didn't have the freedom that Imam al-Baqir had. So Imam Zayn al-Abdeen had his own ways, his own methods of teaching people. One of the things that he used to do, because he wasn't allowed to go in the masjid of Rasulullah and speak publicly, at that time, as we mentioned earlier, there used to be slaves. The religion of Islam abolished slavery. It got rid of slavery, but in a slow, in a ordered manner. In a slow way, the religion of Islam got rid of slavery. But at that time, there was slaves. And slavery, of course, some, sometimes many people, they ask, how did the religion of Islam accept it? Slavery was not something that started with the religion of Islam. It was an issue that it had to deal with because it existed before Islam. But the religion of Islam abolished it. And one of the ways was through the recommended acts. For example, if someone breaks their fast in the month of Ramadan, one of the kafara is to free a slave. It's highly rewarding to free a slave. So the religion of Islam encouraged it. One thing that Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam used to do is that he used to buy slaves. You know, when the, the Muslims were, the Muslim land was advancing, they were growing, and there were many slaves. So what Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam used to do was that he used to purchase slaves in the hundreds. He used to purchase them but then he would free them. How would he free them? He frees them after he educates them. He would make them ulama, and then he would free them. And this is one of the main, less, main things that is known for Imam Zayn al-Abdin alayhi salam. Because if you buy a slave who does not know how to speak, does not know how to read, does not know anything, and you free him, he's going to fall back in crime, he's going to steal, he's going to fall back, he's not going to do anything. So Imam Zayn al-Abdin used to teach them, he used to educate them, he used to make them become ulama, and then he would free them in the way of Allah. One of the narrators, he says that one day, one year in Medina, there was a drought. There was a drought, and we all went out in the desert to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do istisqa, salat al-istisqa. He says we all went out, he says, we were asking and asking and asking Allah to send rain and nothing was, no, our dua was not being answered. This narrator, he says, 
Suddenly I heard someone from behind me saying, Oh Allah, innaka ta'lam. Oh Allah, you know that I have not disobeyed you. So please send rain upon us. He says, as soon as I heard this person, as soon as I heard this, I saw it began to rain. He said, I looked back. I saw it was a slave, a man who looked like a slave. He said, I began to follow him. He says, I saw him go back to the house of Zayn al-Abideen mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He says, I went in the house of Zayn al-Abideen and I told him, I want you to give me a slave. I want you to give me someone. He said, I will give you. Come and choose whichever one you want. He said, we, I saw all of them, but I did not see that man that did du'a. He said, no, 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 there's another one. He said, Imam Zayn al-Abdin called him. He saw that old man who had done a du'a, a man who was sinless because of the teachings of Imam Zayn al-Abdin. He said, I want that man. So Imam Zayn al-Abdin said, yes, you can have him. If you're asking me for, Imam never said no to anyone. He said, you could have him. The hadith says that that night, that slave, he asked Allah to take his life because he did not want to leave the house of Imam Zayn al-Abideen Then the man, the man who wanted him, he wanted to take him and free him. He did not want to take him to keep him. But he realized that this man was attached to Imam Zayn al-Abideen But this is just a small story of an example of how the Imam would discipline and he would teach his servants. He would sit and he would eat with them. He, would, he wouldn't think that he was better than them. And then he would free them in the way of Allah. This is one of the ways that Imam Zayn al-Abdeen managed to teach people. Because he cannot teach outside publicly. But he could teach a slave in his own house and then he would free him. And they would become ulama. Another issue that Imam Zayn al-Abdeen is known for is his worship and his ibadah. And this is something that is known all of the Muslims. All of the Muslims, they know, the Sunnis and the Shias, they know Imam Zayn al-Abdeen as someone who was a worshiper, a abid, even from a young age. One of the, even during the time of Imam al Hussein and during the time of the other Imams, one of the narrators by the name of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he was known as one of the Ubad, one of the worshippers, one of the known worshippers. He said, one day we were going to Hajj. As we were going to Hajj, I saw a young child, waladun subai. Subai means at the age, around the age of seven. So this is during the time of Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. He said, I saw him walking to Mecca from Medina. But he's not walking with the caravan. The, the route from Medina to Mecca lasted two weeks. He said, I saw him walking alone. And he's not carrying anything. So I went to him and I told him, Who are you? And where are you going? And where is your belonging, your food, your, your, your fuel? How are you going to fuel yourself for this route? He said, he looked at me and he told me, Rahilati Rajlai. My caravan or is my feet? Rahilati Rajlai Wazadi Taqwai. And my Zad, my fuel, my sustenance is my Taqwa in Allah. Wa Maqsadi Mawlai. And my, my final destination is my Mawla, Allah. He said, what kind of a word? What, you know, what kind of a person speaks like this? So I told him, who are you? He said, Ana Makki, I am from Mecca. He said, I told him, explain more. He said, Ana Qurashi, I am from Quraysh. He said, tell me more. He said, Ana Hashimi, I am from Bani Hashim. He said, I told him, tell me more. He said, Ana Alawi, I am from the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, I stopped asking him because I knew he was from that household. I let him go, then a few days later in Mecca, 
I saw him speaking and there's hundreds of people listening to him. I said, who is this man? They told me, Hada Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abideen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Historians mention that Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam used to serve the Hujjaj. He used to go, you know, there were caravans at that time. And there was a caravan that is leaving from Medina. This was later on during his Imam and after or before. He used to go and join a caravan that's coming from another place, from Yemen, for example, or from Iraq, where people don't know him. He would join that caravan and he would serve them. Serve them because they are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he goes and he serves them. Then once they reach Mecca, they find out that he is Zain al-Abideen. They become embarrassed. Or when they find out he is he, who he is, he leaves the caravan and he goes by himself. Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam was known for his ibadah. Another story, one of the, another, another one of the known ubad by the name of Tawus al-Yamani. This man, Tawus al-Yamani, he says one day in Mecca, in Masjid al-Haram, at that time there was no electricity, it was dark. So people would do tawaf during the day. At night time, only one or two people would do, be doing tawaf around the Kaaba. He said, Tawus, he said, in the middle of the night, I heard someone holding on to the sitar of the Kaaba, to the, to the drape of the Kaaba. He said, I heard someone doing dua and saying, Ilahi gharat nujumu samawatik wa haja'at uyunu anamik wa ghallaqat al muluk abwabuha wa babuka maftuhun lissa'ileen. A very beautiful dua. He says, Oh Allah, the night has come and everyone has closed their doors. Everyone closes their doors at night time. Even the kings, they close their doors at this time. But your doors, oh Allah, they're always open. He says, and I ask you, O oh Allah, to have mercy upon me and show me the face of my grandfather Rasulullah in the darkness of Qiyamah. The day of Qiyamah is dark. Allah describes it, Nuruhum yas'a min bayna aydihim. Whoever, everyone has their own nur in their face and in their hands. The Iman is the light on the Day of Judgment. He says, I ask you to show me the face of my grandfather, Rasulullah. This man, Tawus, he said, what kind of a person does dua like this? He said, I heard him cry and cry and cry until he fainted by the Kaaba. He said, I rush to him. I go, I sprinkle water on his face. I look at him. I see this is Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abidin. He said, I told him, you are the son of Ali, Imam al Hussein. you are the son of, Al uh, you are the grandson of Am Amir al Mu'mineen. your grandfather is Rasulullah, Fatima al Zahra is your grandmother, you, you are saying this, then what should we say? Mm -hmm. He said, he looked at me in that darkness and he told me, Ya Tawus, da'anka hadith abi wa jaddi, fa inna Allah khalaq al jannata liman ata'a. وَلَوْ كَانَ عَبْدًا حَبَشِيًّا وَخَلَقَ النَّارَ لِمَنْ عَصَاهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ سَيِّدًا قُرَشِيًّا He said, O oh, Tawus, do not say who my ancestors are and who my family is. Because Allah created the heaven for whoever obeys Him, even if this is a slave from Ethiopia. And Allah created the hellfire for whoever disobeyed Him, even if it's a Sayyid from Quraysh. This is a very important teaching that the Imam السلام, teaches us. That there is no racism in Islam. There is no tribalism in Islam. The Arabs, they lived a lifestyle of, I go back to this tribe, I'm from this family, and I'm from that family. Imam Zayn al-Abideen, he came and he implemented 
the teaching of the Quran, Inna Akramakum and Allah, Atqaqum, the one who has the most karama in the eyes of Allah, is not the one that has the most money, not the one that is white, not the one that is Arab, not the one that is from this clan and this country and this group of people. The one that has the highest karama in the eyes of Allah is the one that has the most taqwa. And this is one of the main secrets of the religion of Islam, why the religion of Islam has succeeded and has grown so much. Because the religion of Islam, a main teaching, a main core principle in the religion of Islam is that there is no prejudice, there's no racism in the religion of Islam. Of course, there are some prejudiced people, there are some racist Muslims, but the teachings of Islam are not like them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, from the first day he brought Bilal, Bilal who was an African slave from Ethiopia, a freed slave, he told him go and do adhan. Some of the Arabs, they didn't like that. They said, Ya Rasulullah, you bring this crow, they called him a ghurab because he's black and because he's not Arab. They said, you bring this ghurab to come and, and do adhan while the Arabs are here. They told Rasulullah, Bilal does not even pronounce correctly. Instead of saying ashhadu, he used to say ashhadu. So Rasulullah told them, Sinu Bilalin Shinun and Allah. The scene of Bilal when he says ashhadu, in the eyes of Allah it's ashhadu. Don't worry about it. This is, this is how Islam got rid of prejudice and it got rid of racism. And this is Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam who was teaching. This is one of the ways that he taught people through this, that there is no clan, no clan is better than the other clan. So this is one of the things that Imam Zain al-Abdin is known for. Another thing is his ibadah. Because he couldn't publicly speak and teach people, he has to teach people through his actions. And sometimes, or not sometimes, all the times, actions speak louder than words. You act, something, it's going to have a greater impact than going and talking to someone. And this is a lesson for us, my dear brothers and sisters. Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, one of the narrators, he says, on a cold, windy, raining night, he says, I saw Zayn al-Abideen Ali ibn al Hussein carrying a bag on his shoulder, and he is walking in the in nighttime, he's going somewhere. So he said, I told him, the bag was heavy. He said, I told him, where are you going? What are you doing? He said, I'm preparing for my journey. I'm preparing for my safa. He said, I told him, oh Imam, I have some servants. Let them come and help you carry this. He said, no, no, no. This is a journey that I take, everyone takes. I take it on my own. He said, I thought that the Imam was leaving the city and he's going somewhere. He said a few days later, I saw Imam Zain al Abidin in the city. So I told him, what, what was that? You were carrying something and you said you were going on a journey, but you're here. He said, the Imam told me the journey that I was talking about was not a travel in this life. It was the Akhir. It was preparing for the afterlife. And I was carrying of course, the man, he discovered that the Imam was carrying food. He was carrying food to give to the poor people. Especially on that windy, cold night where everyone is in their house. Everyone is comfortable. You know, a lot of us give charity. But when do we give charity? We give charity when it's convenient for me. I don't give charity when it's not convenient for me. The Ahlul Bayt. They teach us to give charity when it's not convenient. They give it when they're hungry. They give it when they're in need. This is when this is when the sadaqah really counts. This is when the charity has a greater value. This is when one dollar will equal ten thousand dollars. In time of inconvenience, that one dollar that you give will be worth much more than just one dollar. Because it's a difficult time. So, in the eyes of Allah, even a small piece of bread, when you are hungry, it's worth like a huge meal that you're giving. And this is what Imam Zayn al-Abidin teaches. To give 
to prepare for the afterlife. And this is what he did, alayhi salam. Another very important lesson that we all inherit from the life of the Imam is the beautiful du'as, the beautiful munajat, the beautiful spirituality. My dear brothers and sisters, we have to, we have to appreciate these treasures that we have. You know, sometimes we see the du'a book, it's sitting on the shelf. The only time we take it out is during the month of Ramadan. Only sometimes. This is a book of treasures. These books, du'a, a du'a book like Mafatih al-Janan, a book like Sahif al-Sajjadiyah, all of these books, Diyā al-Salihin, these books that bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it have? This is the keys to paradise. And these du'as are the du'as that we take, we took. This is what the Ahlul Bayt left for us. This is the this is the inheritance that we inherited from the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Where, where do you find a group of people in all this universe, in this world? Where do you find a group of people that every Thursday night is a night of du'a, a night of spirituality, a night of getting closer to Allah? You only find that with the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Okay. Where we have du'a kumayl, the du'a of Amir al muminin The du'as of the Ahlul Bayt. All of you see Muslims, they ignore that. Now you have a problem with Amir al muminin you don't follow him. Okay, the du'a does not have anything in it. The du'a does not mention anything that you don't like. What's wrong with sitting and reading some of the du'a kumayl, for example? You see, many are afraid of the heritage of the Ahlul Bayt. In Mecca, if you've been to Medina, how many of you have been to Medina? If you've been to Medina on a Thursday night, the Shias, they gather to recite Dua Kumail between Masjid and Nabi and Baqi. Inshallah, if you haven't gone, you will see this, this great spirituality. They gather between Baqi and between the Mosque of Rasulullah to recite Dua Kumail. The Shias, they come. And you find the ones who are not Shia, they just look. They don't want to listen. They don't want to hear. I remember one time we saw, we saw someone passing by listening to the Akumail. He closed his ears and he walked by. This is just like the people of Nuh. They used to they used to cover their heads and they don't want to hear the hidayah. And of course, these past few years, the last time I went and the time before that, you have Saudi police with their guns around the people reciting the Akumail. Yes, because Imam, Zain, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Wa buka. Because our salah, our weapon is not guns. Our weapon is the munajat that brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And this is why they're afraid of the cries of the Shia. The cries, what's, what's the cry going to do? You find a gathering where Shias are gathered in Muharram just to cry for the Ahlul Bayt, someone comes and he blows himself up and he kills hundreds of them. What so? What the, what scares you from the cries that we have for the Ahlul Bayt? This is the heritage that we inherit from the Ahlul Bayt, we have to use it. The beautiful du'as, du'a in Sahifa Sajjadiyya, the du'as that are recited the Sahif al sajadiyya these are the du'as of Imam Zain al-Abdeen. The du'a that is recited during the month of Ramadan, many of them, they are taught by Imam Zain al-Abdeen. One of the beautiful du'as that inshallah in a few days, all of you will recite during the Sahar hours. Du'a Abu Hamza al This beautiful du'a that teaches me how to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, many Muslims, the ones that do not follow the path of the Ahlul Bayt, they go and they become Sufi and they follow this group of people and that group of people. Why go here and there when you have the beautiful du'as of the Ahlul Bayt? You don't need to go far. It's right in front of you. You have the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt. This is how you reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a beautiful part of du'a Abu Hamza Thumali that you all will recite. Imam Zain al Abidin, he speaks to Allah on, in the perspective of a sinner. On our perspective, teaches us how to speak to Allah. He says, Ilahi, law qarantani bil asfad, 
ومنعتني سيبك من بين الأشهاد ودللت على فضائح عيون العباد وأمرت بي إلى النار وحلت بيني وبين الأخيار ما قطعت رجائي He says, oh Allah, if you were to expose me on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life, He does not expose us. I'm a sinner. I disobey Allah, but Allah conceals. Allah does not expose me. But on the day of judgment, يَوْمَ تُبْلَ sarair, The day that there is no secret. So He says, oh Allah, if I were to be exposed on the day of judgment, if I were to be exposed on the Day of Judgment, I would still say, my Lord is Allah. Because I have no one other than Allah. He teaches us how to have spirituality, how to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very important point from the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt. And another point is that through the du'a, Imam Zain al-Abideen and the other Imams, they teach us aqidah. They teach us who Allah is. Through the dua, when you read dua Kumail, you learn about the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you know so, many, so many sentences in the du'as that teach us who Allah is. Ya man yu'qi man sa'alah, ya man yu'qi man lam yas'alhu wa man lam ya'rif, tahannunan min huwa rahma. It teaches us about the generosity of Allah teaches us about the mercy of Allah. And this is something we learn our aqidah. Who, we learn who Allah is through the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt So this is what the Imam did. He was known for his worship through his spirituality. This is how he taught people. This is how he saved the religion of Islam. This is how he taught people aqidah. He brought people back to their aqidah so that they have a strong aqidah ideology in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would worship Allah night and day. One of the names of Imam Zain al Abidin is as sajjad the one who is always prostrating. Another name of the Imam is Dhuthafanat, the one that has Thafanat. Thafanat are the the knees of the camel, you know the knees of the camel, they would become so rough. So rough because the camel sits in the desert, in the heat of the desert, they put their, they, their knee on the heat of the desert. They say that the forehead of Zayn al-Abideen became like the knee of the camel. The thafanat he became. His skin became so rough right here from prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how he became Sayyid al-Sajideen wa Zayn al-Abideen. This is one of the teachings of this great Imam. And another final lesson that the Imam taught was that his bravery. In, in the palace of Yazid, in the palace of Yazid who was the king who had killed his father, he had the head of Imam al Hussein in front of him. Imam Zain al Abideen, when he saw when Yazid ordered the speaker to go and speak on the mambar, Imam Zain al Abideen he yelled at that speaker and he was in chains, he was in captivity. He yelled at the speaker, Ayyuha al Khatib, Laqad ishtarayta marvat al makhluk, bisakhat al khalaq, fatabawa maqadaka min al nar. He says, Oh speaker, you are selling paradise and buying the hellfire. So be prepared for the hellfire because you are cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahlul Bayt. Then he tells Yazid, he says, Ya Yazid, he doesn't call him Amir al Mu'mineen, he doesn't show any signs of respect. He says, Ya Yazid, let me go and speak. Yazid at first did not allow. And then the people around him, they said, What is this young man going to do? He was 22, 21 years old at that time. They said, What is he going to do? He's weak, he's sick, he's frail. Let's see what he has to say. Imam Zain al Abideen gave that powerful khutbah that shook the foundations of the Umawi government. Immediately, Yazid he gave the head back to Imam, Imam Zain al Abideen and all of the heads and the belongings, and he sent them back. 
This was the bravery. But Imam, Imam Zain al Abidin, he played a very important role in preserving the aqidah through teaching, through the du'as, the spirituality, and preserving our attachment with Imam al Hussein and the Ahl al Bayt. How did he do that? He did that by shedding tears. This was what he did. He used to shed tears for Imam al Hussein. He walks by a butcher. He sees a butcher is about to slaughter a sheep. He tells him, Oh butcher, I have a question to ask you. Have you given water to the sheep? The man says, Yes, we are following the sunnah of Rasulullah. He says, Assalamu alayka ya abata. Oh my father, you were killed thirsty. In every occasion, he would shed tears. They bring food for him, it would be mixed with his tears. They bring water for him, it would be mixed with his tears. Abu Hamza Thamali, he asks him, Oh Imam, isn't it time for you to stop crying for your father? It's, it's, it's in your family. Everyone in your family has been killed. Shahada is that strange for you. He would tell him, Ya Aba Hamza, Adatuna, Karamatuna, Min Allah is Shahada. However, yes, Allah has blessed us with Shahada, and we don't cry for the Shahada. But I cry when I remember every time I look at the face of Zainab and Um Kulthum and the woman when I remember what they went through. Just by doing that, Imam Zain al Abidin salam managed to revive the message of the Ahlul Bayt and the day of Ashura. Every day became Ashura. Every land became Karbala according to the teachings of Imam Zain al Abidin salam and today, our attachment to the Ahlul Bayt, it has to do with Imam Zain al Abidin, who preser preserved the teachings of Imam al Hussein. Imam Zain al Abidin, he lived his life. At the end of his life, he was poisoned by the Khalifa, who was very jealous of him, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He became very jealous from the Imam because. He knew, he knew that people are attracted to the Imam. There's a gravity towards the Imam. In one event, in one event, and this is known amongst all of the Muslims, that Abdul Malik ibn Warwan, he decided to do the Hajj. He went to perform the Hajj. So he wanted to go and kiss the Hajar al Aswad. He wanted to go and kiss the Black Stone. He couldn't. Every time he goes, People push him from here and there. He's shoved from left and right. Just like today, if you go, you see you're going to be shoved all over. He's, he was sitting and he was watching the Kaaba and the Hajar al-Aswad. He couldn't go. He said, the narrator says, suddenly Imam Zain al-Abideen, he walks and people, they automatically move away. And they give him room and he goes and he kisses the Hajar al-Aswad. He kisses the Hajar al-Aswad, and then he goes and he does tawaf. So Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he knows who Imam Zain al Abidin is, but he tries to disgrace him. He says, Man hadha? Who is this? In a way where he is saying that I am better than him. There was a poet, a poet by the name of Al-Farazdaq. This poet, he was standing there, he began to recite poetry in front of everyone. Al Farazdaq, he began to say, ha, he began to say, Hadha al ladhi ta'rifu al batha wa atahu wal baytu ya'rifuhu wal hillu wal haramu. This is the one who is known by Al Batha. Batha is Mecca. Batha knows his footsteps. He is the son of Mecca. And the bait, the house of Allah, knows who he is. And halal and haram knows who he is. This is the son of the best of the ibad of Allah. This is the taqi, this is the naqi, this is the tahir, the pure. This is 
Zain al Abidin, Hada ibn Fatima in Kunta Jahiluhu. This is the son of Fatima. If you do not know him, Al Urbu Ta'rifuman and Karta wal Ajamu. If you do not know him, all of the Arabs and the non Arabs they know who he is. He says a long poem praising Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he places Al Farasdaq in jail just for that poem that he says. Then Imam Zain al Abidin, he goes and he pays the bill and he takes him out of jail. This is Imam Zain al Abidin, salam, this great Imam who we conclude this three days of celebrating the births of these heroes of Karbala with Imam Zain al Abidin. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyarah. Yesterday we spoke about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. We spoke about Imam al-Hussein. They were gharib, they were mazloom. But at least now they have a shrine. At least now millions of people, they go to the shrines of Imam al-Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. But where are the ones that go to the shrine of Imam Zain al Abidin? 60 years ago, this corrupt government this government that works day and night against the religion of Islam, they destroyed the shrines. There were shrines there. They destroyed the shrines of these holy Imams, of these children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyarah of these great Imams and the shafa'a of this great Imam in this life and in the afterlife. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين